Immaculate Queen of all saints, Saint Benedict, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today with the Church, we celebrate the memory of the great abbot, monk, Saint Benedict, who founded uh, the Benedictine order and wrote the great rule which has guided so many countless souls uh, on the path of holiness in monasteries throughout Europe in the beginning and then throughout all of the world. Before commenting on the specifics of St. Benedict's life, just the fact uh, he's regarded as the father of Western monasticism and he's also considered, uh, or he is, a patron of Europe, named patron of Europe by the Pope. And in looking upon his life, uh, it brings to mind uh, a reflection on how a single person who uh, obeys God's will and seeks God with all his heart can have incalculable effects on future generations. I think it uh, unlikely that St. Benedict could have imagined the consequences of his life on future generations. Uh, He was born in the year 480 and died in 547. And uh, as far as I know, lived his entire life uh, in what is now known as Italy near Rome. And yet, His impact has touched civilization, world civilization, and uh, he's credited really with the movement that he began um, for the preservation of a great uh, part of Western civilization, even from Roman times that uh, was threatened by the barbaric invasions that took place in those centuries uh, before and after his life. And yet uh, the the light of that civilization was maintained uh, largely through the work of the monks who copied great works and preserved them in their libraries and studied and kept alive that culture, the great culture which um, on which our civilization is founded. It's impossible uh, in our present moment to imagine what will be the consequences of our lives for future generations. And yet I'm sure that wasn't even really a consideration uh, for St. Benedict beyond uh, his wanting to ensure that those uh, sons and daughters of his who followed his rule would have uh, a path, a sure path to follow in their pursuit of God. But beyond that, I don't think he imagined all of the, um, the spread of Benedictine uh, spirituality in numerous monasteries around the world and uh, the consequences of Benedictine, uh, the influence of the Benedictine order on the life of the church, which to this day is great. Uh, rather, he was seeking God and in that singularity of focus, uh, all of the other consequences flowed from that. And it's for us a lesson. That's what I would like to say before anything else, that uh, we need not concern ourselves with anything else. And in fact, that was uh, his great phrase, one of the great phrases, that he uh, actually borrowed from St. Cyprian, but which is associated and uh, preserved also in his rule. Uh, in Latin it goes, Nihil amori Christi preponere, prefer nothing to the love of Christ. And in that singular uh, rule, everything else is consequence. In pursuing Christ, and putting nothing before Christ, 
uh, then the Christian soul is elevated above anything uh, petty or temporal, purely temporal, and in seeking Christ, then the soul is elevated uh, to that greatness, which then makes a, a soul uh, immortal, not only in God, but even uh, as in the case of St. Benedict and many of his followers live on in the generations of, of human history and culture, that spirituality that, uh, that flows from total devotion to Christ becomes immortal and immortalized in those who come after. St. Benedict then, just for a few uh, facts about his life for those of us who uh, are not so familiar, uh, he was, as I said, born in 480 and he was sent to study in Rome, but uh, he wasn't, he was repelled uh, by the, the evil that uh, dominated in the city and so uh, went off initially to live a hermetic life uh, in the mountains not far from Rome. And because of his holiness, he began to attract uh, disciples and followers who wanted they actually, a group of monks, asked him to come and be their abbot, but uh, after a short while, didn't care for his austerity and actually even tried to poison him. Uh, he left, of course, and uh, went back to his hermetic life, but then again, uh, others started coming to him. He left Subiaco, where he was, and went and founded the great abbey of Monte Cassino, uh, about a two, almost a two-hour drive from Rome. Today, it's a two-hour drive. Uh, he there founded this monastery and instituted a way of life, which, I, as I said, is still practiced to, the, to this day, a life that uh, could be some of the key aspects um, one of the things that was explained to me uh, when I made a visit and a retreat at a Benedictine monastery about the, the stability, which is a remarkable difference between us Franciscans and the Benedictines, uh, the point of stability that St. Benedict insisted on was because at that time uh, there were many monks and people living uh, the monastic life, but uh, Oftentimes, the seriousness of that life was impeded by this uh, ability to just get up and go. Whenever life became difficult at a particular monastery, the monks were allowed to make pilgrimages, and so there were many uh, vagrant monks who would just vagabond-type lifestyle going from place to place and never really necessarily making any great progress in holiness. So St. Benedict uh, insisted on stability of life, that the monks would stay put wherever they entered into uh, that form of religious life. Another famous aspect of the Benedictine spirituality is ora et labora, the balance between contemplative work, uh, contemplative prayer and work. The, mon the monks uh, support themselves by their work, uh, farming in the fields, making wine, making cheese, a variety of uh, activities that also help them uh, just live and make a, make a living. And so they find this balance, but uh, the focus always being on glorifying God. And, and so there's a great devotion uh, to silence, which is a necessary prerequisite for union with God in prayer. They focus on especially um, the sanctification of the hours through the praying of the divine office. Uh, the Benedictines are well known for their attention uh, to the liturgy, uh, it, its beauty, its regularity, and they also practice Lectio Divina, uh, a method of reading and meditating upon Holy Scripture. And there's one aspect of the Benedictine rule, too, that um, I learned of 
recently when I was at this Benedictine monastery, uh, one of, it's called conversio morum, which means, uh, translated from Latin, would be the conversion of life or of habits. And it's really um, a fundamental expression of the gospel. We know our Lord, uh, at the very beginning of his ministry, the first uh, instruction he gave was repent and be converted. And so uh, St. Benedict instructed his followers to make this a vow, a, a daily practice. And so returning again to um, the, the virtue of humility that then became and is today this, uh, this greatness of St. Benedict, is simply focusing on Christ in all things, putting Christ before all things, and devoting one's life to seeking God and to being converted to his will. And that for us, whether we uh, are Benedictines formally or not, is uh, precious advice. And St. Benedict has given us a great example in his own life and then in the lives of so many of his followers uh, who have become great saints. Let us invoke the intercession of the great abbot, Saint Benedict. May he inspire all of his sons and daughters and the church to put nothing before Christ, to seek Christ with a singleness of heart and to achieve holiness and thus transform the world and imbue it with true civilization. Praise be Jesus and Mary.